Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Falk, the Interim Executive Director of the Santa Fe Council on International Relations. Thank you so much for joining us, which for what I know is going to be a fascinating program. Uh, welcome, Peter. Good to have you with us. Up oh, and you're on mute. Oh. There we go. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. You would think as a species we'd have figured out all of these tech issues There's by no now. There's no doubt but... that's going to be yeah. in Webster's Dictionary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I also want to give special recognition to our strategic partner, Collect It Works. Uh, hope that you'll purchase a copy of Peter's book there if you've not already done so. And uh, also, I just learned from the owner of Collect It Works that there's an organization called IndieBound. And if you go to IndieBound.org, if you're checking in from another part of the country, they'll refer you to a, a independent bookstore right by your neighborhood. So I hope that you'll be able to do that. So again, let me just quickly introduce Peter. Uh, University of Oxford, BA History and Politics. And Peter, I realized when I was looking on your resume or bio somewhere, your MA in International Re uh, Relations was not at Beijing University, uh, but is that correct? It said actually Peking. Yeah, for some reason they they keep the old uh, way of spelling the city, but it's you know it's the it's the same it's the it's essentially the same place, but just. Sure. Uh, yeah. But I haven't seen Peking in a long time, unless I was in a restaurant. <laughs> exactly. And then of course a master's in international relations at the London School of Economics. So great to have you with us, and I'm so appreciative that you uh, contacted me. Golly, probably about two months ago, even three months ago, before the book came out, and. Uh, enjoyed reading an advanced copy. Let's just start our conversation by asking you, which surprised me, the incredible amount of access that you were able to, to get. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, reporting on Chinese politics, it's, it's always a matter of um, taking kind of a, a, a thousand little shards of glass and trying to um, trying to put together a, a, a kind of stained glass painting. It's um, it's pretty difficult to come across one source or one small group of sources who um, who are going to crack the code for you. It's a matter of just spreading a wide net and, and and collecting as much as you can. So my my approach was really to draw on um, you know my time reporting in Beijing, interacting with with Chinese officials, and then I did some some pretty extended interviews in in Washington um, and and else in London and elsewhere. Um, to try and get a sense of you know what what it's like to really interact with Chinese diplomats and but the you know the main source base for this was this group of um, about a hundred memoirs written by former Chinese um, envoys to to foreign countries which are pretty turgid and hard work but I kind of was looking for for little um, bits of color which would illuminate what their kind of experience was like and eventually um, found about a hundred of them and and that kind of added up to the book. Did you do most of that when you were with Bloomberg from what 2017 to what about three years to 2020? Were you able to yeah. on the book then? Exactly. Yeah. So I was with Bloomberg in uh, in Beijing um, for that period and I'm, I'm now with Bloomberg in uh, in Washington reporting on the Pentagon and the um, the intelligence agencies. So, um, so that still has a good dose of of China. But um, yeah, I've, I've re relocated to a slightly easier place for journalists to work. Well, we'll talk about this in a few minutes. But you 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 mention and note that Chinese diplomats are very cautious about what they say. Right. And what surprised me is that some of the mostly gentlemen that you spoke with and some women or in their memoirs, they were very candid. Yeah, you know, so a lot of a lot of the best material came from this period, um, from the 1990s to kind of the late 2000s, um, which was a, a period of kind of relative openness in China's political system. Of course, the, uh, you know, Communist Party ruled China has never been all that open, but, but relative to today, um, back then really was a period where people were able to kind of express their opinions a little bit more. And, you know, you've got to, you've got to be on the lookout for this stuff. You kind of find after, um, you know, page after page of just endless accounts of meetings and, and uh, you know, foreign trips and these kind of things that eventually, oh, wow, there's an opinion just kind of tucked in there. And 
maybe it, maybe it got past the censors or maybe they decided that, that they were okay with um, an opinion or two. Now, were most of these written in, I suspect, in Mandarin and you, you speak and read? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you know, we think about the long-term tradition of American diplomacy and Western diplomacy, but that certainly was not the case in China. And I wonder if you might spend a little bit of time about talking about how Chinese diplomacy evolved and really sort of their resentment towards the West. And then we'll talk about who you call the father of Chinese diplomacy. Sure. Well, you know, it's um, we're so used to thinking about countries having foreign ministries and state departments and these kind of things at the moment that we kind of take it for granted. But but actually, um, the, the system of diplomacy that we all are used to um, really was kind of a European creation and, and largely a, a 19th century European creation. You know, the office of the ambassador went back further and you can trace it back further, but, but the, the foreign ministry as we now know it dates from about that time and the rest of the world didn't have that institution. And so when China was at its most powerful, uh, you know, the Qing empire was an incredibly powerful empire at, at one point, especially in the, the 18th and early 19th centuries. And um, it didn't have a single foreign ministry that we think of today. It had a whole bunch of different ministries that dealt with the outside world, um, depending on the kind of relationship that, um, that the Qing empire wanted to have with that, um, with that country or, 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 or place. And so uh, it wasn't really until China had this, um, this devastating encounter with uh, European imperialism in the mid 19th century with the opium wars and, and those kind of events that, um, that it, it dawned on them that they, they might need a set of institutions that looked like that. And actually, um, you know, that, that China's first effort to create something that looked like a foreign ministry was called the Zongli Yaman, created after the second opium war. And its first institution called a foreign ministry was created after the Boxer Uprising, and both of those events involved massive use of Western military force and very humiliating Chinese defeats. And so kind of the, the whole history of diplomacy in China is tied up with this story of a, of a once mighty empire being humbled at the, at the hands of Western powers. And so that mindset is, is very much embedded in the way that uh, China even today thinks about diplomacy. There's this great emphasis on being respected, being treated as an equal, um, and you know sometimes a, a pretty testy response if they feel that that's not uh, that's not put into practice. So tell us about uh, this fellow who you and I hope I have the right picture for it uh, with with uh, President Nixon. Yeah, so that um, is the right picture, and it's. Um, it's a picture of Zhou Enlai. So um, when the when the communists took over China in 1949, you know this was the this was an outcome of decades of warfare in China, and the communists were able to overthrow a nationalist government, which was recognized by the United States and other world powers. And uh, Zhou Enlai came in and served as the foreign minister, the first foreign minister of communist China. Um, and really the right-hand man of Chairman Mao, who is the, you know, the number one ruler. And, and Joe faced this, um, you know, he, he was an incredibly suave, sophisticated person uh, born in the late 19th century. And he had spent time in Japan, France, Germany, a little bit of time in England. He spoke multiple foreign languages. And of course, he was a dedicated communist. And, and Joe was really faced with the task of taking this new government, which was really a pariah state, it had no friends uh, outside of the communist bloc, and, and winning for it a place in the world. And he had to do that, uh, you know, in the context of working for a political party, the Communist Party, which had spent decades underground uh, fighting the nationalists, was, was very paranoid about its ability to exist and its tenuous hold on China. So he had to come up with an approach for diplomacy, which, uh, you know, at once was capable of building bridges with the outside world, but was also very mindful of um, 
that precarious political situation back in China. And, and the outcome was, uh, was a, a type of diplomacy that worked for the time, but is, is in many ways still in place now, 70 years later. So you had all the, the, the first cadre, the first class of foreign service officers, if you wish, were mostly generals. And I think you used the quote, or they used the quote, uh, Joe did, <clears throat> you are basically warriors in civilian clothes. That's exactly right. So he, you know, he, he, he had to put together a diplomatic corps for China uh, with this kind of drawing on this ragtag group of, um, as you say, generals who had served in the People's Liberation Army of former soldiers, low level bureaucrats and a bunch of fresh university graduates, some of whom, um, or many of whom had never left the country, didn't speak foreign languages, had have never held a, a knife or a fork, let alone attended a diplomatic reception. And, and so Joe had to kind of take this group and, and shape them into something that was capable of, you know, conducting this, this strange arcane art of, of global diplomacy. And, and the way that he did that, I think of it a little bit like when a Silicon Valley startup wants to go from, you know, a group of five guys sitting in someone's garage to a big multinational company, they pin a set of values on the wall and they say, this is what we're all about. You know, Google did that with don't be evil, right? That was their kind of motto. And the way that Joe and Lai did that for Chinese diplomats was that he said, you need to think and act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. You know, you might not understand diplomacy, but you understand how to do battle and you understand how to follow orders and show great discipline. And above all, you understand that as soldiers of the Communist Party, your loyalty is to the Communist Party above all else. And so that, that was kind of the ethos that he used to set up China's diplomatic corps. And um, as I say, you know, it, it worked then and it's still in place now. You know, one of the wonderful uh, points of, um, not trivia, but tidbits that I found so interesting was that, <clears throat> In Mao's, let's call it the President's Daily Brief, the PDB, uh, there was an excerpt from, uh, by Richard Nixon in Foreign Affairs. How did that lead to all the, the it looked, you really talk about, there were a lot of false starts and misunderstandings and efforts uh, by both countries to begin negotiations, but it didn't happen easily, did it? No, you know, it was a it was a multi year process. And um, in, in many ways, it, it kind of could only have happened under as staunch and anti communist as as Richard Nixon, I think, you know, any any Democrat would probably have been called, um, you know, a communist sympathizer if they tried to get close to, to red China. But, but, you know, Nixon and, uh, and Henry Kissinger were interested in doing this. And at the same time, um, Chairman Mao was interested in getting close to the United States. Um, you know, China found itself um, by the mid 1960s um, estranged from the Soviet Union. Uh, in 1969, there were even armed clashes on the, the China Soviet border um, and, and really very, very isolated. And he, he spotted this opening. Um, you know, he realized that, that Nixon wanted to turn the, the, the tide of the Cold War against the Russians and, and he wanted to win some friends and to, um, you know, shore up his own position. And so there was this kind of strange and unlikely meeting of minds between, uh, between Richard Nixon and Chairman Mao. And then, of course, the, the, the second representative to China, I guess, was George H.W. Bush. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, exactly. President Bush uh, ended up as the head of the U.S. representative office in, in Beijing. So this is before the U.S. had established full diplomatic ties with an embassy. Um, and he, you know, he had this um, storied background in, in foreign policy even then and was seen as kind of a natural person to represent um, U.S. interests. And the Bush family uh, has really maintained very close ties with um, some of China's top leaders from then right the way through till today. And in fact, the, the most senior Chinese diplomat um, today, a man called Yang Jiechi, who's a member of the ruling Politburo in China, uh, has known the Bush family since the late 70s, since that period, and um, 
has 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 maintained those ties. He would visit um, uh, President Bush Senior in, in in Texas each time he visited the the U.S. and and uh, maintained uh, strong ties with the whole of the uh, George W. Bush uh, entourage as well. Of course, some Republicans back then were very happy that George H. W. Bush forty one was not in the United States <laughs> because they saw that he would be a a candidate for president. So, uh, and of course, I think this picture is such fun because he was also known, wasn't he, as the bicycle ambassador and he and Mrs. Bush really enjoyed their years there. I think they did, yeah. David, uh, I mean, um, I said David because I was thinking of David Farstein. We had him here last week and he is, uh, you, I suspect you know him, he is the founding uh, director, president of the George H.W. Bush Foundation um, at U.S. China Foundation in Austin, Texas. That's terrific. Um, so, um, and, and, and that's maintaining, as you said, that very close relationship with the whole Bush family in China, which brings me to Tiananmen Square, because that really put President Bush in an awkward situation. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, you know, um, I think the the 1980s, or the, they, there were ups and downs in in U.S.-China relations, but but on the whole, had been this period of of extraordinarily close and surprisingly uh, warm cooperation between the U.S. and China. Um, the two countries had had actually shared intelligence on uh, fighting the, the to, to help counter the Soviet effort in Afghanistan. Chinese officials had been busy learning about, uh, you know, how the stock market works in the United States, how the social security system works here, you know, busily kind of taking notes. And, and it seemed like there had been this, um, this, this kind of beautiful meeting of minds, which, which many American officials felt understandably might lead to China at some point looking a lot more like America, you know, perhaps a capitalist democracy. And so there was, there was a lot of hope wound up in that, almost a lot of romance uh, kind of wound up in it. And, and that came um, to a, you know, to a really tragic end with the crackdown on student protesters in, in Tiananmen Square, um, which really set China on this trajectory of, of becoming a, a pariah state, you know, sanctioned by the outside world. Um, and, uh, you know, with a, with a kind of real freeze in its diplomatic ties um, with the West, which it was then the, the task of Chinese diplomats to try and undo. And, and I hadn't remembered that Bush 41 was the first president to sell F-16s and really serious weapons to Taiwan. That must have really been a blow to the PRC. Yeah, it, it was, and they, they saw it as, um, as, as a real betrayal, but uh, you know, he, he explained to China's leaders, this is something that I need to do uh, because otherwise, you know, things are not gonna work out with my domestic constituencies and, and I face re-election. And so, that, you know, China, China kind of decided that um, they, you know, they were, they were angry and they were hurt, but they, they decided that they would rather deal with um, uh, a somewhat tricky George H.W. Bush than with a really difficult Bill Clinton who wanted to talk about um, their human rights record and was was calling them the butchers of Beijing and things like that. And of course, uh, history history has a kind of ironic way of working out and they did end up with Bill Clinton and things worked out anyway. Right. Uh, going back in history a, a bit, uh, it reminded me some of what you wrote about with the Cultural Revolution as, as well as the Great Famine. Uh, somewhat like the McCarthy era here, where uh, un unlike the United States, where a State Department officer might just have been forced out, or fired, or, or had to resign. In China, the families were brutalized, and in some cases tortured. I mean, that must have I mean, obviously uh, decimated the, the foreign ministry. How did it rebuild? Yeah, you know, it, it really did. And you know, in, in a lot of countries, uh, as you said, that the State Department in the in the 1950s, when when things get tense at home and there's there's kind of a move toward nativism and, and nationalism, uh, sometimes the, the diplomats are the first people who get blamed because, you know, they're the ones who are out there meeting foreigners all the time and 
they live overseas and it's easy to call into question you know their loyalty and uh that that same that same process happens in china but in the context of a political system that puts no limits on on government power and under chairman mao was was run by someone who was quite erratic and um who held uh really very extreme views on on economics and and ideology and so you know diplomats kind of found themselves at both of those times accused of being disloyal to the chinese revolution um of being capitalist sympathizers of having you know uh, tie, traitorous ties to, to Western countries, and in the in, in the Cultural Revolution in the in the nineteen sixties, things got so extreme that uh, Chinese ambassadors were locked in cellars by their their you know pe people who had been their subordinates. They um, were forced to clean toilets. Some of them were beaten until they coughed up blood, and and a number even in di died uh, in in prison. And it was as China sought to sort of rebuild its place in the world, especially after the, the Nixon and Kissinger visits to China, it was, it was a really traumatic period. You know, these ambassadors had to go back overseas and take charge of embassies where months earlier their subordinates had been shouting at them and calling them, them traitors. So it was, it was really very difficult and, and very scarring, but, you know, piece by piece um, through the, the 1980s all the way up till today, there's been this slow and steady move toward professionalization. And, and until relatively recently also, by and large, there's been a movement away from having a very, very political foreign ministry. But of course, Xi Jinping has started to change that as he's, um, he's a very political president. Full disclosure, I lived in Houston uh, in the, I guess, moved there in 1981 and watch the consulate open and you know the first diplomats that i met were all wearing their their mao suits and didn't speak english and very stilted and uh, of course now you see a completely different type of a diplomat highly qualified fluent in english how does one enter the foreign service now is it competitive or is it political favoritism or how does it work it, it is competitive there's an exam system um and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there's political favoritism, but that there is also this kind of merit based test that really the big the big challenge for for Chinese diplomacy when it comes to recruitment is more on uh, is has more to do with um, can the foreign ministry and the rest of the government compete with the Chinese private sector and can they attract the country's best and brightest because there was a time in the 80s and 90s where if you if you wanted to go abroad and you were a young Chinese person who was smart and curious about the world, then then China's foreign service was your only choice. But um, nowadays, of course, China has uh, you know global companies. People, Chinese students study all over the world. Uh, Chinese tourists travel all over the world, and so it's it's really quite a different um, atmosphere. And the, and the foreign ministry has to try and uh, try and compete with that. You know, brain drain is not the problem that it was in the eighties. Right. So what is the, the, the skills, the method of Chinese diplomacy today? Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I would say that the that, that Chinese diplomats, um, in terms of skill, are really up there with um, many of the, the, the best in the US and, and across the world. Um, they have, you know, developed over the decades, gone from this kind of group of, of, of revolutionary, you know, ragtag students and, and soldiers into, uh, into a pretty, pretty impressive group of people who speak foreign languages ranging from Czech to Indonesian. They, they've studied at fancy places like Georgetown um, and the London School of Economics. They uh, have deep knowledge of, of the countries that they're posted to. And, you know, actually one of the features of, of China's foreign service is that whereas U.S. foreign service officers often hop around between a lot of different countries in China, uh, officials will go back to the same between Beijing and a particular country virtually for their entire career. And so they build up a great deal of, of expertise. And, and now they have experts on things ranging from, 
you know, non-proliferation to climate change to financial regulation and, and all those kind of things too. So the level of expertise is high. I think, you know, the, the great thing that, that holds Chinese diplomats back is, is the country's political system, which, which puts such extreme controls on the way that they're able to interact with the outside world. There's a, a system that, a buddy system that dates back to the 1950s that says that Chinese diplomats have to move around in pairs. Um, there's this, you know, requirement that Chinese diplomats, even if they know that their talking points aren't working, they'll, they'll stick incredibly closely to them just because they're, they're kind of worried about getting on the wrong side of Chinese politics. And we already talked about how uh, scary that can be as a prospect. Um, and under Xi Jinping, you know, he has set kind of a, a pretty nationalist tone for China's uh, foreign relations and, and Chinese envoys are trying their best to keep up with that too. Well, you know, throughout my career, I've probably known and worked with about 10 of the consuls general uh, in, in Texas, which cover, I, I'm not sure which um, consul general covers New Mexico. It may be the one in, in former one in, in Texas, but always in pairs. And I wonder if you might talk about that. I've only known one consul general who would meet with me alone. Yeah, so so th this was one of the, I think the most kind of telling details about um, about Chinese diplomats and it, and it, it goes a long way. The system that gives rise to it goes a long way to explaining that gap between these very smart, cosmopolitan, highly educated people and the kind of displays that we've seen recently where people have started talking about China's wolf warrior diplomacy. Um, so the rule dates back. I, I kind of uh, knew that this rule existed. And one of the challenges in my research was figuring out, OK, so how, how far does it go back? And uh, eventually, many, many memoirs and interviews into the process, I figured out that it dated back all the way to 1949, 1950, with China's first overseas embassy in, in Moscow. Um, the ambassador there, Wang Jiaxiang, was a very senior Communist Party official, official but he, even he felt the need to have um, others around him kind of keeping tabs on him. And, uh, and making sure that he didn't say anything wrong or leak any secrets. And, you know, I think there are kind of two ways to think of this. You know, my, when, when I talk to American diplomats about their experiences, they'll kind of say, well, I, you know, I feel sorry for them. Like these are smart people and it must be so humiliating for them to have to walk around in pairs. And, you know, that's my starting point too. When I think about this, it seems so controlling and intrusive. But when I, when I sat down to talk about Ch to Chinese diplomats about it, their response was that, um, you know, actually we, we see this as a kind of source of protection for us because it means that if someone ever accuses us of disloyalty, uh, there's another person there to vouch for us who can say that we didn't leak any secrets. And so it's, it's curious, you know, it's such, it's such a controlling rule, but it's something that when your head is inside the system and you're looking at, it from the perspective of a Chinese official, it can even seem like a good thing. The other thing that I've observed for a few years is like if the consul general was meeting with the mayor, he or she would you know, t bring out a brief, uh, a notebook and start talking about how the United States should not sell F-16s to Taiwan. What are you gonna do about that mayor of Santa Fe? Uh, and you know, the. The, the mayor of whatever city would say, oh, well, thank you uh, for, for, the, for that. But, you know, there's nothing I can, can do. And is that a lack of knowledge of the U.S. system? I wouldn't think so. Or is it just that they are told to deliver these messages about either arms sales or Tibet or the Dalai Lama or, or some of these uh, key, key issues that are, get really under their saddle? Yeah, it's it's a it's a great question, and it kind of gets to the heart of, of of the way that the system works. And so, two two things come to mind. Um, the first is that you know we we've talked a little bit about some of the shortcomings of of that China's system has when it comes to diplomacy, but there are also some strengths. And I think one of the real strengths is this ability to hammer home messages you know i don't think there's a politician in the world who doesn't know what china's position on taiwan and tibet 
is, you know, because the PRC just has this system where they will repeat it until they are red in the face yes. and they don't care how many times you've heard it. Right. You no, know, and you talk to people in the State Department, they could recite China's talking points on Taiwan and Tibet. They don't need I could to hear too, them after again. All these right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, the, the Chinese will, will go in and repeat it. And I don't think that really wins them friends, but but that kind of relentless uh, repetition really is, is pretty effective at hammering home China's point. And, and it's in some ways, it's kind of a strange strength of the Chinese system. But, you know, I think I think the other the other thing that comes to mind is when when the CIA does training of new intelligence agencies, it, it, it of new agents, it, it, it kind of um, it, it warns them to avoid this trap, which it calls mirror imaging, which is when you look at another society and you assume that that society works using the same rules as yours. And so, you know, we do that to other countries all the time. You know, when we're thinking about North Korea or Iran or China, we kind of will take, I'll take the, the way that Britain works, you might take the way that America works and we'll read it onto that country. Well, well Chinese officials will do that to us as well. And in China, their, their government system has this very clear set of lines going from the, the lowliest, lowliest official all the way up to the top. And if you do give a bunch of provincial Chinese officials a message about foreign policy, it probably will get fed up to Beijing because that's the way that the system works. It's all connected like that. And so, so I think some of what they're doing is just repeating it for the sake of you know, clarity of message, but some of what they're doing probably also reflects the fact that they're thinking of US politics a little bit like they think of Chinese politics, hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Must they or should they, and does it help their career to be a member of the Communist Chinese Party, Chinese Communist Party? Yeah, it's not it's not an official requirement, but the vast majority of Chinese diplomats are members. I've tried to get figures for this. Um, unsuccessfully. I, I would imagine that in the foreign ministry, the number is in the, in the sort of 90 plus percent range. Um, and the more senior you get in the organization, the more likely it is that you need to be a Communist Party member. Um, some people get around that by joining, you know, on, on paper, China is a multi-party system. Of course, the Communist Party completely dominates the politics of the country, but there are actually these little independent parties, which are kind of controlled by the the communists so some people will join those and some people will be unaffiliated but it really does become kind of an impenetrable glass ceiling pretty pretty quickly if you don't join the communist party and and that's become even more important under under xi jinping who is all about party control we're going to get to uh, xi in a minute but tell us about edgar snow and also let me ask uh, our viewers to go ahead and send in some questions i see some and we will work them into the conversation. But who was Edgar Snow and uh, how did the Chinese really use him to deliver their message? Yeah, so so Edgar Snow really was, um, he, he was an American journalist who had lived in Asia for quite a long time and um, was was pretty disgusted with the kind of corruption. He lived in, you know, in, in China for a long time as well. and was disgusted by the kind of corruption that he saw in nationalist China. And he had this hope, um, which, you know, seems um, very naive to us looking back on him now, um, but, but was a little bit more understandable in the context of the 1930s. He had this hope that communist parties might transform poor and, and backward societies into more just and, 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 uh, and, and well-off places. Um, and he, you know, he placed a great deal of hope in particular in Mao Zedong and the, the Communist Party of China. So he had been trying for a long time to get an interview with Mao. And that, that coincided with um, the Communist Party kind of hitting the a low ebb in their political fortunes. They'd been chased across the country by the nationalists in a, in a kind of searing retreat which is now celebrated as a victory in the Long March. And they ended up in this kind of backwater place um, in Yan'an in, in, in rural China. And Snow traveled to that place um, and, and, and met Mao and interviewed him and kind of ha really helped to put um, 
the Chinese Communist Party and Mao Zedong in particular on the map. So he described Mao as a Lincoln-esque leader who was going to, you know, e emancipate the Chinese people and lead them on to greatness. And um, the communists really saw him as someone they could reward with, you know, privilege and access to information that other journalists couldn't get. And in return, Snow would write about them in this kind of glowing way. And of course, you know, that relationship lasted a long, long time, all the way through to the 1970s. And each time Snow came back, the, the kind of backdrop was a little bit more tragic. You know, he came back in the 1950s when China was in the middle of a massive man-made famine during the Great Leap Forward. And, and Snow wrote in a, in a book that he published after that, that he, he searched in vain for any, si any signs of famine, but, but couldn't find any, um, which, you know, there were tens of millions of people dying. And so that, that was kind of the backdrop. But, but, but really, that, that relationship between the communists and Edgar Snow became a template for, um, for subsequent journalists. And in, in just the last year or two, the, the Chinese foreign ministry has been talking uh, about how it would like new generations of journalists to think and act like Edgar Snow. Um, which <laughs> I think is something that uh, yeah. is probably probably not going to materialize from from any of the the top media outlets but you know they they do do these activities where they'll let video bloggers and travel bloggers travel to Xinjiang and Tibet and report on all of the you know supposedly wonderful things going on there and will reward them in a way that's a little bit like they rewarded Edgar Snow yeah be careful of your sources um, right we have a, a a comment and question from Ray Termini uh, he says, it seems as though she uses the warrior policy as a pressure tactic with countries that he wants to get back in line and to not use it where he wants to develop a warmer relationship. Uh, I'd like you to, Peter, talk about what warrior diplomacy is. And I'm going to pop this up because I think this was one of, I guess this meeting took place in Anchorage in March, wasn't it? And, and I, I, I don't think Secretary Blinken was really prepared for uh, what Tiger, um, the uh, member of the Politburo, uh, who was former U.S. Ambassador, uh, Chinese Ambassador to the United States, had to say. Yeah, so, you know, kind of stepping back a little bit, um, this term, wolf warrior diplomacy, um, started to be used widely after this, this 2017 movie called Wolf Warrior 2, was released. And for those of you who haven't had the, the, the dubious pleasure of watching it, it's a kind of Rambo style action movie, which depicts this Chinese hero battling foreign bad guys on the continent of Africa. And it became this just completely unexpected blockbuster box office success in China, because I think it captured this, this sense that China's time had come and that, that China no longer needed to kind of keep a low profile and be deferential to the West, but it could stand up and be strong and be respected. And that just by virtue of the economic and military power that it, had, it could muster, that it would kind of win respect on those terms. And, and, and as Chinese diplomats throughout 2017, 18, 19, began to act also in an increasingly kind of hostile way. They were storming out of international meetings, shouting at foreign counterparts, uh, you know, spreading conspiracy theories on, on, on Twitter and uh, telling foreign, foreign government leaders to shut up and all, all of these kinds of things. Um, that the label of wolf warrior started to be applied to them too. Um, so that's where this kind of idea of wolf warrior diplomacy came from. But you know, we, we talked earlier about how, um, although that seems like a very, very new phenomenon, actually Chinese diplomats have been acting out in this kind of way in some form or another for a long, long time. And the reason that I think that they do that, it's partly to do with hubris and overestimating China's power in the world. And then thinking that the US or whoever else they're talking to is on 
is on the decline, but a lot of it is to do with them as individuals feeling kind of jumpy and insecure about their place in China's political system. You know, if you look back, a lot of the times when Chinese diplomats have acted like this in the past has been when there's been a crackdown in Beijing and their loyalties have been brought into question. And something a little bit like that is happening now in, in Xi Jinping's China. And so what I think when Yang Jiechi sat across the table from Secretary Blinken, and he delivered this extraordinary 17-minute diatribe. He was aiming primarily at impressing his boss, Xi Jinping, back in Beijing. And, you know, Yang, as I, you know, we talked about him earlier with the Bush family, this guy has been a, a US expert since the late 70s. He knows that, that the guy doesn't put a foot wrong. He knows exactly how his rants are going to go down in the US. He knows that he's he's under no illusions that these are going to win him friends. He just doesn't care. He's focused on a different audience, uh, you know, and in many ways, an audience of one, Xi Jinping. Peter, talk about how he can change on a dime. So so he, he I, I think if there's one um, individual who kind of personifies uh, Chinese diplomacy, it's, it's Yang Jiechi. So, so he, he has this, he speaks amazing English, especially for someone his age. Um, he, he is capable of, you know, make, riffing on little jokes and, and making references to things he's read in the New York Times culture section, uh, establishing this, this genuinely warm rapport with, you know, successive generations of President Bushes uh, and, and, you know, and, 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 and is capable of real, real charm and, and, um, you know, in, in the mold of kind of a, a, a true global diplomat. How do you At get the nickname times, Tiger? <laughs> so there, there, are a bunch, there are a couple of different stories. So one is that he was so soft-spoken that the Bush delegation that visited Tibet in the late 70s called him um, Tiger, kind of as a little ironic remark. The other one, which I think is more likely, is that the Chinese one of the Chinese characters in his name kind of is it has has a lot in common with the character for Tiger, and he explained that to the delegation, and so they started calling him Tiger. Um, but it's it's kind of stuck, I think, because he kind of he does really have a, a raw, so it, it it kind of it kind of fits in with his personality. But you know, I I talk to people who have who have dealt with Yang over the years, and so. He'll go from this, this kind of chatty, funny, urbane persona, and in a matter of seconds, he is in this just ferocious mood that kind of makes you want to run out of the room. And, and he, he'll go red in the face, he'll raise his voice, um, you know, and he'll go on for an incredibly, you know, like I said, 17 minutes with Secretary of State Blinken in front of TV cameras. I think, I think Secretary Blinken spoke for 90 seconds to two minutes before Yang went on for 17. Um, but, but when you talk to people who know him, you realize that if he's not out of control for a second. He knows exactly what he's doing. And it's just this extraordinary act of, of will that he's, you know, he's able to put on these performances. So what I don't understand is he's a member of the Politburo now. There's also a foreign minister. So what is the reporting uh, and, and how does this all, all, all work? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good question. So this is, this is the foreign minister, right? Who I'm showing right there. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And his name, his name is Wang Yi. And so he's, he's a member of um, kind of the Chinese cabinet. So he has two types. This is, this is going to get very arcane, but I'm going to be as quick as I possibly can. He has two titles. One is foreign minister. The other is state councillor. And those two titles together make him roughly the kind of same rank as secretary of state. Not quite, but kind of, you know, and so often, oftentimes the, the foreign minister or state councillor has been paired up with the U.S. secretary of state. Uh, young and and and. Yang Jiechi is on an even more powerful body called the Politburo, which is really the body that runs China. And that's not a government organization, that's a communist party organization. And there hasn't been a Chinese diplomat on that body since the 1990s. Um, then the, the foreign minister who, who led Chinese diplomacy after um, the Tiananmen crackdown, Chen Chi Chen, was on the Politburo. And 
for nearly two decades after that, no one made it onto that body and, and Yang made it eventually. And I think he probably made that position, not, not because he, he has, you know, he's owed any sort of personal favors or anything much to do with him, but, but more to do with the fact that, that Xi Jinping wants to establish a very central role for China in the world. And in order to do that, he needs a, uh, at least a working relationship with the United States. And, and Yang Jiechi, being the uh, US expert that he is, kind of filled that role. And I think that's why he got the job. Hmm. So uh, how many members are in the Politburo? There are 25 members in the full Politburo. And then there's a smaller body called the Politburo Standing Committee, which is more of like an inner circle. I'd like you to talk, because we have about another 10, 12 minutes, uh, somewhat about the relationship that she has built with other world leaders, uh, especially how that has been impacted by um, the Trump administration and, and, and now what, what changes, if any, that we're seeing with, with the Biden administration. Yeah. So. You know, I, I think that um, it's, it's taken quite a lot of people by surprise, especially people in China by surprise, that there hasn't been kind of a, a movement toward closer ties um, between the US and China. Um, I think a lot of people in Beijing kind of had this narrative where Trump was out of control and had set US-China relations off down a bad path that, that they couldn't support and that everything was going to be okay once Biden came to office. And, and actually, I, I think that that shows that they weren't really paying close enough attention. You know, I, I, I remember doing a bunch of interviews in 2016 in Washington, when everyone thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win the presidency. And the Clinton team were pretty hawkish on China, especially compared to the Obama team. And they were, they were kind of ready for action. And, and you know, in fact, for, for all of the um, uh, idiosyncrasies of, of President Trump and his team, um, their approach to China really reflected a much, much deeper shift in, in US political circles, uh, which was aimed at getting tough on the country. And so, you know, that, that kind of took, and, and, and that's why the Biden team hasn't recalibrated and it's upset the Chinese and it resulted in um, the kind of outburst that we talked about in, in Anchorage. But you know, it's got really very deep roots. Uh, we, we have a number of questions from one of our members here, Herb Smith. And I think I can paraphrase his questions by saying one word, and that is Taiwan. Yeah. So, so, so this has become um, a real sort of hot button issue at the moment. And there's, there's a lot of concern in, in Washington that she is about to invade um you, you we, all, we all have to be humble when we're you know even people who like me who spend their careers looking at china we have to be humble about the limits of what we know and and there's a lot that we don't know about the situation we don't know what xi jinping's ultimate intentions are and we don't know exactly how far he's willing to push the envelope and it's very important to remember that this is a person who people thought was just gonna be another standard Chinese leader. The guy came out swinging, he abolished presidential term limits, he introduced re-education camps in Xinjiang, he promised Obama that he wouldn't militarize the South China Sea and then he did it anyway. This is a guy who has a high tolerance for risk. So I think it's important to kind of bear all of those factors in mind. Having said that, I don't really see the kind of buildup uh, on the Taiwan Strait that would be necessary for an invasion. Actually, General Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, just today said that he doesn't see any kind of invasion scenario happening in at least the next 24 months. Um, and, and I think that the Communist Party hasn't completely given up yet on the idea that it might be able to unify um, with Taiwan using peaceful means, or at least using measures short of, of, of war. But um, but certainly, you know, the situation is becoming increasingly tense and China is increasingly willing to throw its weight around and, you know, use fighter jets instead of diplomacy to, to solve problems. Uh, Carol Henderson and Carol, next time, if you do me a favor, if you put your question in the Q&A box, 
because I almost missed it because you had it in the chat and it's such a good one. Uh, she'd like you to talk about foreign exchange students. And um, let me just you know mention that right now there's approximately 350,000 Chinese students studying in the United States. And uh, what, what Carol says specifically, can you speak about the role of academic exchanges and visits such as when Fei Zheng Gong's visit to Columbia University in the late 1970s and met with faculty and grad students. Um, don't know about that, but uh, the first exchange students went to the UK, as you point out in your book. But right, um, so it's 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 an important question. It's and it's also a, obviously a very very big question, um, and it's something that has become you know when I when I talk to people who have been involved in. US-China educational exchanges from the 1970s onwards, it's, it's, it's something that's become so political and that's a real point of sadness for them because there was this hope uh, that, that you know, Chinese students coming to the US and studying elsewhere in the West might uh, kind of imbue those students with, with Western values and that they might go back home to China and, and help to change the country and transform it in, in a more kind of democratic direction. And, you know, things haven't worked out quite like that. Um, and there's this added worry that, that Chinese students are used for um, intelligence collection in the US and that they're also used um, to, you know, when they, when they get jobs to, to go and collect intelligence on sensitive or scarce technologies and take that back to China. And, you know, the, the truth is that, as you say, this is a huge number of people and that the, the Chinese government does try to, to, to use every means at its disposal, including students, um, many of whom are not, you know, volunteer participants in these kinds of activities. They're people who just want to have a better life for themselves and, and experience what the US has to offer. But they do get caught up in this and their families are back home and there's there's oftentimes not very much they can do to to say no and so the issue has become incredibly sensitive and um and kind of fraught on on all sides I, I i guess that my my natural predilection is that people people who thought that educational exchanges were going to result in kind of an overnight transformation of china into a democratic society were probably a little bit too optimistic at the outset. But that that doesn't mean that exchanging opinions with people isn't valuable and that that building bridges, but you know, after all, these are the two biggest economies in the world. And it it's no exaggeration to say that the future of world peace relies on the relationship between them. And, and that, you know, for, for for there to be a healthy relationship, it needs to exist at the leadership level, at the military level, uh, political level, and, and also at the society level. And so, so I think the hope for a lot of people is that somehow the, the, the US-China educational relationship can survive in a way that's sustainable, but also protects um, you know, US interests when it comes to sensitive technologies and, and, and espionage too. What are your thoughts about the Confucius Institutes? And many of them have now been closed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they fall into kind of the same um, camp. There are some pretty well documented stories of Confucius Institutes being used to, to pressure universities to um, cancel events with um, speakers who might upset the Communist Party and, and that kind of thing. And, and, and you know, ob obviously, from the, the point of view of academic um, freedom, that a, lo a lot of people get offended by that and, and, and see it as quite understandably um, unacceptable. I, I guess that the the kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the unwitting kind of casualty that goes together with that is the fact that a lot of the schools where Confucius Institutes do the best work are often underfunded colleges that don't have large endowments or, you know, they have some high school programs. I know there's one in, in Maryland near DC uh, with schools that couldn't otherwise afford to teach foreign languages in that way. And so at the same time as the, the, these programs get shut down for very understandable reasons, there's kind of collateral damage. And, and it means that a bunch of students who, who wanted to learn Chinese and, and uh, you know, are no longer going to have the opportunity to do so. 
You know, I was surprised that she did not go to Glasgow. And I know that he's, he's not traveled much, but I remember, you know, the, this, this famous speech that he did um, at, at Davos, uh, where he really was juxtaposed to President Trump. Were you surprised that he didn't go to Scotland? And um, because it, it really does seem that the expression biding our time is no longer what is the operative policy. Yeah, I, I, I was surprised um, because Xi Jinping has spent, you know, you, you pointed out that famous speech in, in, in Davos in, in January 2017, and he made such an effort throughout the Trump era to kind of step into what China saw as a void in US leadership and to take a bigger leadership role. And, you know, of course, climate, uh, together with trade and other issues, climate was one of the issues China used to, to try and do that. Um, but I think, you know, when, when you think about Xi Jinping, it's kind of useful to think about there being two Xi Jinpings. There's one person who goes to Davos and APEC and talks in these fancy summits and, and preaches openness. And there's another Xi Jinping who is all about domestic politics. And this is the guy who abolished term limits, who rewrote the rules of Chinese politics, who elevated himself to the same status in, in many ways as, as Mao Zedong or certainly Deng Xiaoping. And, uh, and that Xi Jinping is a lot less concerned about global opinion. He is all about his own power, preserving his political base. And, and I think that that version of Xi is all about securing a third term for himself as president um, in an upcoming um, party Congress. And so I think, you know, him staying away from that probably reflects that some politicking at home and is also, you know, also reflects the fact that he sees himself and Chinese political elite see, see Xi as the key to the country's future. You know, without Xi Jinping, they can't make China great again. And uh, therefore, he can't be exposed to any risk of COVID-19. And so I think it's kind of those two things that have, have kept him from traveling. But, but certainly it's a missed opportunity. President Biden uh, leapt on that fact and, and said that, you know, uh, it was it was a, it was an abdication of leadership that she wasn't there. So we have another minute or so. How do you describe the relationship between the United States and, and you know, maybe I shouldn't just say because it would be different. Let me ask you the relationship between the United States and China and then give you another minute to talk about the relationship between the EU and China, because sometimes it's at cross purposes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I would use the same the same word for both of them, which is strained. Um, the the the. In now, the last case week, of the United... Farst, let me. Last week, uh, yeah. David Farstein said the relationship has never been worse since the resumption of diplomatic relations. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I, I I think that Tiananmen, the post Tiananmen era, might come in as a close second. Um, but I think I think that that's probably true, just because the risks are so much higher. You know, China's now the second biggest economy in the world. Um, it's strained, and I think that that people are trying to figure out if it um, if it represents a new Cold War, and maybe it does, but it's certainly not a Cold War that looks anything like the last one because of the you know we discussed the educational ties. There are the deep economic ties, and crucially nations in the EU and across the world are, are really dependent on China and the future of China's growth for their prosperity and their ability to flourish in the future. And so we're not gonna see the world divide into two hard fixed blocks. We're gonna see something that looks a lot more messy than that. Um, so if it is a cold war, it's not, it's not one that any of us would, uh, would, would be too familiar with. No, that's for sure. Well, Peter, I think you can tell, and I hope our viewers can, how much I enjoyed your book. Um, thank you. Thank you for the email that you sent. And uh, I, I was caught by what David Ignatius said, uh, one of my favorite reporters, a columnist. Uh, Peter has decoded Chinese diplomacy in this fascinating and carefully researched study. Uh, Stephen Hadley, Evan Osnos, uh, Michelle Flournoy. I mean, you. I, I know people often get blurbs, but the blurbs that you have really stand out and uh, uh, hope, hope, hope you'll be able to come to Santa Fe sometime, either to speak to our members or just to come and enjoy the hospitality. And 
want to thank everyone for being with us tonight. Um, and we'll see you again, hopefully, with the Canadian Consul General. And Peter, where can we easily follow you? Yeah, you can you can follow me on Twitter at, at Peter Martin underscore PCM. Um, or you can find me on my Bloomberg author page where uh, you can subscribe to my articles. But, I, you know, I wanted to thank uh, all of you for, you know, for, for hosting this event and Jim for doing such a wonderful job at, um, you know, asking smart questions and, uh, and, and, and really provoking a very lively and, uh, and stimulating discussion. Well, great. Thanks so much. And go enjoy your nine o'clock beverage. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it right ready for me here. So, All right. Yeah. Good night, All everyone. Right. Bye. Thank you.